Bible says that, th that God is enthroned upon the praises of his people. And, you know, it's a very different dinner table when the father's at the head of it dishing out the food to, the, to everybody at the table. And uh, he's here, and he's sitting at the head of our table, and there's a feast here today. And so we're very thankful. Thank you, uh, Pastor and team, for leading us in worship today. All right, so the word the Lord has given to me to share with us today is from the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 13. We're going to look at the, th the last three verses of the chapter, verses 7, 8, and 9. <clears throat> and I'll be reading uh, out of the English Standard Version today. Here, the prophecy goes like this. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire, and refine them as one refined silver, and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, thank you for this prophecy, and thank you for its original audience, which would have been the the people of Israel come back from Babylon waiting for the Savior. And thank you, Lord, for its preservation. And the same Holy Spirit that breathed life into this prophecy for those people is here and invoked today to breathe life into it again for this people and for this time. And so, Lord, uh, we're not waiting for Christ's first coming, but for his second. And the stakes are incredibly high today. And the commission that Christ left us with and for which he's waiting upon us to fulfill before his return is the single greatest mission on earth. And so, Lord, today, uh, may this word come and uh, quicken our hearts to be about your business today. And uh, may it change the world indeed. In Jesus' name. Amen. The maxim in business is adapt or die. Um, consumer desire spins round and round like a weather vane um, in the winds that bluster in winter. Okay, it just, Consumer desire is always moving. It's hard to track. But profitability means matching your work, whatever it is you do, to uh, the, the consumer's whims. You, if you want to make money, Whatever it is that you're producing, you need to make sure that there's interest out there in the marketplace for it. Your product needs uh, to have an interest in the marketplace. Otherwise, what happens is you become like Eastman Kodak. Some of you might remember Eastman Kodak. Uh, Eastman Kodak was a, a blue chip company for 130 years, uh, which in the 1990s boasted a workforce of 145,000 people. And they had an annual revenue of $19 billion. But by 2012, Kodak was bankrupt. OK. When was the last time any of you developed a roll of film? Anybody? <laughs> Been a while, OK. Because Eastman Kodak failed to adapt, it went bankrupt. And that's why uh, in business, there's always moving and changing. That's why McDonald's is always changing its menu and always you know, freshening up and remodeling its stores. Uh, this is why Cadillac adds a cup holder this year and Chrome rims the next. This is why Netflix creates a new series, uh, The Real Housewives of King Crab Fishermen who take the ice road to their, uh, their second job as a bounty hunter trying to track down game wardens who are selling illegal cupcakes. Okay, this is, <laughs> they're always trying to get, uh, to get you, to get you to move, okay? Now, adapt or die, that makes sense in a dollars and cents kind of way, um, certainly, it, it, and that, we all understand that. And what works in business tends, has a tendency to be applied universally, because that's how we, we value business acumen, probably above anything else in our world. And this desire to, to kind of uh, to apply a business model to everything in life, actually, it comes into the church as well, that churches are very... Uh, inclined to, to use that, these same business principles and business acumen in the church. What we found was that church attendance began to decline very steadily 
really all over the West, uh, but the United States here about 50 years ago, you started seeing a real steady decline in church attendance. You also began to see a contraction in the number of church fellowships all over the country. And uh, it, it, it was a real problem. And the American impulse, okay, as we saw, you know, membership evaporating in churches, and as we also saw these wonderful churches on our main, you know, on our, on our town squares and, you know, these proud, beautiful buildings being shuttered, the American, the impulse of the American church was not to prostrate itself in prayer, but to adapt. Okay, that, that's, that was what we, that's kind of where we went was, well, we must change what it is that we're doing. And so what the church decided to do was to study changing trends, to try to understand shifts in culture and philosophy, and to rebrand itself and to retool itself and its ministry and message to meet modern needs. Okay, we didn't want to be Kodak, where we, were, we had a bunch of stuff that we were selling that nobody was buying. And so the church said, you know what? We need to change uh, what it is that we're offering to, in order to get people back. Basically, the church had tons of supply, and we did. We had tons of supply of truth and, and gospel and Jesus Christ, and, but there was no demand anymore for it. Okay, And because we had all this supply, and because there was very little demand anymore in the country, we changed our supply, and we started restocking our shelves. And we warehoused, the church warehoused scholarship, the church warehoused piety, spiritual disciplines, and sacrifice. We said, that is not selling. Okay, uh, you know, giving, renewing people's minds, uh, committing people to, to the mortification of the flesh and all the sacrifices, of, that is not working anymore. Okay, so let's just, let's take all that down off the shelf, let's put that in the back room, and let's pull out entertainment, experience, platitudes, and a bunch of attaboys and attagirls, okay? Let's do that instead. Now, from all this catering, and I think you guys know well what I'm talking about. Um, I hope you do anyway. We, we, you have all been living for the last several decades where the attractional model in church has been ascendant, king, okay? We're trying to get people back to church. We've been trying to attract them back. Now, from all this catering, we did get some of the cows back in the barn, okay? We did, we did some of that. Uh, we had to make the barn really nice, okay, really nice, and we had to offer artisanal hay uh, to get them in, and we had to have our farmers be very charismatic personalities, okay? Right, Nathan? Yeah, I mean, really, I mean, you, you understand. So we had, to, we had to make everybody, we had to make this place really sweet, okay, to get everybody to come back in. But here's the problem. What brought them in, okay, and what we have to do to keep them in is not the business that we're in, okay? And that's, that's the big problem. That's the trap that we fell into, is that, yeah, we brought all these people back in, and we're, and we're doing a lot to keep them in, but that's not what we were called to do. The church now, this compromised, you know, catered, catering to the public church, it does have a place in the community. It does have a lot that it does, and miraculously, it makes budget, okay? But... It's not making disciples, okay, which is the business that we're in, and that's the trap that we fell into. So, you know, if you want to see particular birds outside your picture window, and I, I know some of you love seeing birds, then you need to put out a particular type of feed and seed. Um, you, you put out thistle for finches and millet for quails. You put cracked corn out there for the blue jays, peanuts for woodpeckers safflower for cardinals, and you put oranges out for orioles, okay, if you really want to see them. And what happens is, you know, if this bears out for our feathered friends, if that's how it works, if I want to see all these beautiful things that are out roaming the woods, if I want them to come to my house so I can look at them and be around them, I have to feed them what they want. We, we start to think, well, if that works for our feathered friends, perhaps that will work for our neighbors as well, okay? That, you know, I want my neighbors, I want my, I want my family, I want my friends, I want my spouse. I want them all to come here and experience what we have. I want them to hear the truth. I want them to be saved. I want them to be ready for when they die. So we say, the church has said, so if, perhaps if we just filled up our church feeder with all the stuff that they want, all the right stuff, then the world would flock to us, okay? And here's this thing, perhaps it will. I mean, 
you know, it does work, by the way. You spend enough money and you provide enough services and you, you set it up all just right. You can get a lot of people to come to a place like this, okay? But flocking is not the object, okay? Attracting is not the trick. Changing people's lives and appetites is the mission. Transformation to holiness and transformation to righteousness is what we're in business to do. That's what we're working to do. We are salt and light. We are the agent of salvation in a lost and weary dying world. And this is our chance before Christ comes back to get people ready. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. Now, that does not magically happen when people step foot onto the property. Any more than the birds who come to your feeder are now suddenly your pets and are going to stick around. They're going to get a beak full and flitter away. And that's what we found with a lot of folks coming into church, too. They get a beak full of whatever they're interested in, whatever you're providing, and they flitter away. Okay. This is not how Jesus built his church. He did not do it that way, okay? He didn't go around Galilee trying to give everybody everything that they wanted. Instead, to, he built his church by calling men and women to do what? To come and die, okay? You come and die with me. Give up your whole life, sacrifice, lay it down right now. He promised us trouble. He built his church by calling men and women to do just that, to lay down their lives and to give all to the highest and most noble cause there is in the universe, the gospel, the good news, okay? That's what we're in the business of doing. And what, you know, I'd rather fail at that, okay, than succeed at getting a lot of people in the barn. Okay, that is, that's no longer a good and noble goal to attract people somewhere, okay? A good and noble goal is to transform people, okay, and to change the world. And so I think to that end, this is a, this is Zechariah, this is God speaking through Zechariah to God's people at a time where he's explaining to them that there's going to be a reckoning, okay? There's going to be a sifting and a culling, and it's going to be painful, but in the end, it's going to create truth, it's going to create authenticity, and it's going to create power, okay? Power. And so, Take it to heart. This is what the Lord put on my mind for us today. And so let, let's take a look at it. The first thing I want us to see from this passage is that we are not damsels in distress. Okay, I've used that picture before, but I'm using it again this morning. We are not damsels in distress. Look at me at verse 7. Here, it, this is the Lord speaking through Zechariah. He says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd. And the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. In Romans chapter 7, Paul talks about, it speaks of a conflict that's raging within himself. Do you remember that? Um, it's a battle between his flesh and his spirit. This is the famous passage where he says, that which I want to do, I do not do. And that which I do not want to do, I do. Wretched man that I am. I cannot beat it. Okay, I've got, this, I've got these two things warring within me. I have this desire to follow God and to be righteous, but I also have this incredible desire to, to go off into the ditch and live however I want to live, okay? And, and, I, and I'm, I'm tormented. We might imagine, there are times, okay, where we might imagine that that same conflict that exists within us exists within God as well. Because as we look at God and we study his nature, we see that he has several characteristics which appear to be at odds with one another, okay? Uh, if you study the character of God, he has all these, th these big... Uh, characteristics, part of his nature, and some of them to us seem to be at, that, that they're, they're conflicted. For instance, God is a great God of grace, is he not? Okay, we hear about that. He's full of grace, but he's also full of judgment. Okay, he, he's full of judgment. So in this, in this battle, does one of those characteristics gain supremacy over the other that you know, he, he, he can't be gracious and judgmental toward me at the same time. Also, we see that God is full of love. We know that. But we also see from Scripture that he is full of hate. He has hatred for certain things. We see in the Bible that he loves to bless, but we also see that he is quick to curse as well. And in this passage, the conflicting character that we, that we, that we see here, what appears to be conflicting character, is his wrath, when he says, awake, O sword, okay, and to strike the shepherd, the shepherding instinct within the Lord, which is that, that instinct to protect and to put under his wing. It's the rod and the staff idea. 
We see in scripture God saying, I am very sorry I made the world. You know, I, I wish I hadn't made it. it the, the world is breaking my heart. And so what does he say? I'm sorry I made this world and I'm going to flood it. Okay, and I'm just going to wipe it out. But the same God says, but I love the world. And I'm going to send my only begotten son to go and save it. Okay, so which is it? You know, it, which wins today? Is he going to flood me out or is he going to come and rescue me? These characteristics are symbolized and personified in this passage in this idea of a sword, okay, where God is saying, you know, waking my sword, my wrath, and strike my protection, okay? So what's going on here? It seems as though he's awakening his wrath to strike at his wing. The Bible loves to use that idea of a wing that, you know, just as a, a, a mother bird will uh, protect its chicks or its young under its wing. That's the shepherding part of who the Lord is. And we know from scripture that the Lord did put his people under his wing, that he sent rain to water crops in a dry and thirsty land. Israel, as a, as a promised land, was not a place with big aquifers underground. There weren't tons of rivers. I mean, the Jordan is smaller than the Kachiko. There's not, and it's a dry, it's like a, it's a, it's the Mediterranean dry climate. And if it weren't for rain, they wouldn't have crops. They wouldn't be able to eat. But God always sent rain and he put a hedge, an invisible wall around its border. So that keeping Egypt below the Negev, Assyria above the Golan and Babylon to the east of the Jordan. How could little Israel keep these massive world empires off of its land? during all this time, if it weren't for God's protection. And he established his law in the land, and he resided in a temple that he had built for himself. He lived there, actually lived there, in Jerusalem. It's remarkable. And he was planting wonderful things all over the land and cultivating them with his prophets, with his priests, and with his very word. But now, what you see in this passage and what you saw uh, when Isaiah was prophesying is that he's going to tear it all down. Okay, he's going to withhold his reign. He's going to remove his protection. He's going to have the prophets imprisoned, and he's going to uproot all that righteousness. You saw the northern kingdom of Israel uh, fall in 720. You saw the southern kingdom of Judah fall in 586. The whole thing, God just tears it all down. So is God conflicted then and at odds with himself? No. <laughs> okay. No, he is not. Okay, he is not conflicted. He's not at odds with who he is. He's not having this war within himself. And we don't have to wonder today, are we going to get the Old Testament God or are we going to get the New Testament God today? You know, am I going to get fiery wrath where the ground opens up and we all get swallowed? Or are we going to be blessed and preserved and protected and forgiven? As Solomon said, there is a time and a season for everything. God's character, all of it, is perfectly complementary, okay, he is not sometimes red with anger and at other times blue with compassion. He is purple with royal fatherhood, okay? All of God's characteristics are always at play all the time. There's not one time where one gains supremacy over the other. He is simply God. He's not a collection of personalities, but simply God. Now, what we see or what, we might, what may seem like manic behavior on his part is simply a response to our mania, okay? We're the crazy ones. We're the conflicted ones, the unstable, the capricious. We're the ones that are nuts. And so because we're acting in a manic way all the time down here, you know, praising God this morning and, and living a riotous La Vida Loca life this afternoon and evening, that's our fault. Okay, so if he's embracing us this morning and coming after us with the rod this, this afternoon and evening, that's on us. That's not on him. He is himself all the time. We're the, he is all wise and loving. So what do we learn from this awakening of wrath and the removal of the shepherd? What I think what we learn here from his, you know, saying, all right, I'm, wake up, sword, and strike my shepherd. He is weary of tending goats. That's what we're finding, okay? that under his wing are a lot of goats, and these goats are kicking at his wing, okay? And he wants sheep. He wants sheep. And in Israel and in the people of God, there are sometimes an awful lot of goats, and he gets weary of tending to those. You know, in old Westerns, there's the recurring trope of the damsel in distress. You know, this is the 
poor innocent woman who's tied by ropes to the train track and there's the locomotive chugging its way or the woman who's stuffed into a barrel and set adrift on the raging rapids of the Colorado River and some guy in a white hat gets into a shootout with some guy in a black hat and the guy in the white hat wins and then he goes and rescues her and there's that curly haired yellow haired uh, a uh, woman who's freed, and uh, you know, it's all it ha ends happily ever after. That that's that's that damsel in distress idea. Well, listen, that's not us. Okay, we're not an innocent victim. We're not held hostage today. None of you are held hostage today by some black-hatted Satan, where you're tied by ropes to your life of sin, and you're tied by ropes to the dangerous position, the perilous place you put yourself in your life, waiting on a savior to ride in and save you. That is not true. Okay, I've got bad news for you today. You want to hear it? You're free. That's bad news for you, some of you. You wish you were bound. You wish you were chained. You wish you were in trouble. You wish that Satan had you and by his grasp and you could just cry out and wait for the Savior to come and rescue you. It's not like that. You're free today. You're free to pursue righteousness today and you're free to pursue sin and rebellion. Okay. Remember when he brought Israel into the promised land, he put up on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. I put before you today both a blessing and a curse. You decide. You're free. I'm not going to put my knee on your neck in the land to come here. I'm not going to be a helicopter god. Okay. I'm not going to be watching over you all the time. You decide how you want to live. Okay. And that freedom is destroying us. Like I said before here, Zechariah was post-exile. Okay, his grandfather came back with the exiles from Persia when Darius sent him back with Zerubbabel to rebuild. And you remember Nehemiah came and rebuilt the wall. Well, this is a long time after that. Okay, this is this is this is a, a good a good bit of time. Okay, and he's he's there in the land. He's prophesying during a time where he's trying to encourage people to rebuild the temple, not just the walls. And he's encouraging God's people. He's saying, guys, we need to change. Okay. Because what, what happened, well, the reason why we went into exile in the first place is because of our hard-heartedness. We need to change. And I, I'm just going to say to you all here today, too, we need to change. Okay? We have this great freedom that God has given to us. We need to use it to pursue holiness and righteousness and the Lord. There's an old Arabian tale um, that's told about this uh, very poor peasant type person. Okay? He hadn't eaten in several days, and he came up upon this wonderful big estate that was owned by the barmicide, okay? And he, so he, apply, he appeals to the front door and the servant sees that he's destitute and, and starving and he welcomes him in and he introduces him to the barmicide and there he is in his main room and the, the peasant tells his pitiful tale and the barmicide says, you know what, I take pity on you. Um, I'm gonna give you a fantastic big feast, okay? And he sends his servants out to go and prepare the feast and the, the first thing he does is, uh, the servant never comes back but the man comes over him carrying an imaginary bowl and he puts the bowl down and he starts sticking his hands through the bowl and he begins to wash his hands and he dries his hands on a fake towel. And so the peasant says, well, that's really weird, but I'm hungry and I think he's got food somewhere, so I guess I'll play along. And so he starts, he washes his own hands. Then he said, uh, well, you know what, next, uh, we're gonna start with a bread course. I've got some really wonderful, fresh baked hot bread and some olive oil for us to dip it in. And he has that come out, but it's imaginary. And he breaks the bread, and he starts dipping it in the olive oil, and he begins to eat it and chew on it. And he says, I'll play along. So he takes the bread, and he's, he's imagining too. And uh, this goes on and on, with every, course after course. Finally, a big roasted lamb comes out, stuffed with pistachios. And this peasant, and his mouth is watering now as the guy describes all the food. And he's, his jaw's getting tired from fake chewing. And dessert comes out. And the story ends. I mean, he's got this. Uh, he finally, at the very end of all this, they've had their, all the big meal. He brings out the wine. And he th throws the blanket off this, these goblets of wine. And they start to drink deeply. And this poor peasant um, gets drunk on the imaginary wine. And he starts getting angry. And he, I guess he's an angry uh, drinker. And uh, he starts uh, assaulting the uh, the barber side, silly tale here, by the way. Um, and he's assaulting, the, the, the barber side's so blessed by this, the good humor with which his guest has treated him, how he played along the whole time and got totally into it, that he says, you know what? I appreciate you. 
and now we're going to really have a feast. And he brings in all the real food and all the real dessert and all the real and wonderful wine. And he blesses that man and has him live in his house forever. I like that story for a couple of reasons. I think for a lot of us, when we come to church, we feel like we're having that barmicide feast, which that there's, it seems like everybody's, uh, it seems like people are happy here. And it seems like people are worshiping. I see people raising their hands and I guess there's food here, but I don't see it. Um, I know a lot of you come into church and, and you have friends who seem to have or family members who seem to have rich feasts in the word of God and in church and in worship, but you don't see it. But I, I'm, I'm blessed. I want you to know the Lord's blessed by when you come into a place like this, hungry, starving for the truth, starving for change and revival, and you keep a pot and you, and you play along and you say, you know what? I'm going to trust and have faith that if I come to church and if I bow to pray, and if I sing, and if I seek him with all my heart, that eventually the real feast is going to come out. And I think in the church today, we've been starving for a long time. And I pray that the Barmicide feast, the imaginary feast, is about to be over. And that we're all going to be able to taste and drink and eat and to our heart's content of the real presence of God. Amen. I pray so. All right, the second thing I want you to see in here is that while we are not damsels in distress, we're also not refugees. Look at me at verse 8. It says, In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. Okay. There are those who see God and his kingdom as heavenly means to an earthly end. Okay, what I mean by that is you have something that you need in your own life, something you have, something you want, and you see God and his kingdom as a way to achieve that. And I would call these people refugees. Okay, these, for these people, their home is the world and, you know, they will regularly flee to God and appeal for his help with their finances, uh, with their relationships, with their health, their career and so forth. But as soon as they have what they need, as soon as their relationships made right, their finances are back in order, their health is restored, whatever, they go back. Okay, they're just refugees. It's not their home, the, the God's kingdom. Their home is in the world. You know, for this, you know, kind of think Dorothy going to Oz um, to get back to Kansas. You know, she, they all went to the Wizard of Oz to, to get something from him, okay, for their own lives, okay? That, that's how some people see the church. They're, they're coming to see the wizard, okay? And they're hoping that they're going to get courage and strength and money or whatever it is they're looking for, and, and then uh, they're going to go on their merry way. They're attracted, you know, this, this happened a lot with Jesus when Jesus was here on earth. People were very attracted to his might more than to his message. They, didn't, they really dismissed everything he had to say, but they wanted something to eat. They wanted him to resolve a conflict, to heal them, to kick the devil out of them, whatever it was. That's one set of people that are within the church. The other is there are those who see God and his kingdom as the heavenly end worthy of all their earthly means. Okay, These are people who see, well, heaven's my end. And the kingdom of God is my goal, and I'm going to use all my earthly means to, to get there. These I would call pilgrims. Okay? These are pilgrims who have left home. They've left the world. This is not their home anymore, and, and they're on their way. For these people, their gold is invested in imperishable treasure. They want, they want to invest and gain things that don't rot and rust and where moth don't come in and, and destroy. Their hands work for... An empire that's eternal, okay? They don't want to work just for something that they know is going to have, that's going to time out. Their talents and gifts are used to glorify the creator, not themselves. Their days are spent climbing ever higher and higher, never coasting. Like I mentioned last week, think Bodger and Luoth and Tao, that bull terrier, um, lab retriever, and Siamese cat in The Incredible Journey, who leave the wonderful warm hearth that they had to go the 300 miles across the Iron Mouth Range of Western Ontario to go home, okay? That's who God wants us to be, people who are willing to sacrifice comfort to gain the kingdom. Now, the Bible often talks of, you see this in the Old and New Testament, the Bible often talks of the true and the false believer existing within the community of faith. Sometimes it's expressed as the sheep and the goats. Other times it's the people who are taking the broad way and the straight and the narrow way the apostate and the remnant, and you also have the wheat and the tares. That's the illustration Jesus gave. 
Now, in this passage, the faithful are represented, basically, by a third of the company of the people. So a third of the people of Israel are the true believers, and two-thirds are the false believers, okay, who are just in it for whatever. Now, there's always going to be a sifting. There's always going to be a culling and a crucible. God regularly takes his people to the threshing floor. He does it all the time, okay? Um, the wilderness was a threshing, was it not? Okay, when he takes his people to the wilderness, and unfortunately, only two people made it out of that, okay, out of the millions who entered into the wilderness. Uh, exile in Babylon was a threshing. Nero's persecution was a threshing. The Reformation was a threshing. And millions of other trials beside, all threshings, okay? Just look at this church, look at a manual church for a moment. Manual church has been around for a very long time, since the 1880s. Uh, this church has lived through a Great Depression. Uh, this church has been through two world wars, boom times and recessions. It lived through the sexual revolution, revivals, backslidings, building campaigns, meteoric, meteoric rises this church has seen, and really pretty fantastic collapses as well. This church at one time had 600 people in attendance on a Sunday morning. There have been splits and divisions, mass exoduses, pastors falling. We had a pastor commit suicide many years ago on a Sunday morning at his house, okay? We have had gains and losses. There was a pandemic in 1918, and there was a pandemic in 2020, and this church lived through both of those. This church has seen an awful lot, and in all these instances that this church has gone through, those are all threshings, okay? They're all crucibles. They're a time for culling and finding out who is a refugee that's just gonna go back home and who's a pilgrim who's gonna see it through, okay? So the question that we have to ask ourselves here today, okay, are you in the two-thirds company that's gonna be cut off and destroyed? Are you in the third that's gonna get thrown into the fire to be refined, to be fit, a fit vessel for the Lord for all to come? You know, it's springtime, it's the first day of spring, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And if you look at all the deciduous trees out here, it's very hard to know which are alive and which are dead because every tree looks dead in the wintertime, okay? And you all know that a dead tree can stay standing for many, many years. But as the temperatures warm and the sun continues to wax, we're gonna see which trees bud out and leaf and you're gonna know which are alive very shortly and which are, are, aren't alive anymore. Listen, the day is coming very soon where we're gonna know who in here is alive, who in the church is alive, Okay, who is rooted and who is fruitful, who's, who's budding out and blossoming, okay? And I pray that we find that out, and that occurs long before Jesus Christ comes back, which is the great getting up morning. That's the real test, and that's going to be the true judgment. Listen, we are not refugees, okay? And if you are a refugee here today, okay, if you're just here, um, as this is a port in the storm for you, and you're trying to get your life back together, I'm glad you're here. And it's a good reason to come. I mean, I mean, it's a wonderful place to be. But you cannot stay a refugee for long, okay? I love the story of a pilgrim's progress. Christian left his home there because it was going to be destroyed. He started just as a refugee, but what you see for that story is he eventually wanted to go to the celestial city. He never wanted to go back home. So I pray as you've come here, if you've came as a refugee, I pray that you'll stay as a pilgrim and that you'll be interested in the kingdom and that you're gonna move forward. Remember when, um, when Jesus met the woman at the well, she was there because she was thirsty. Her house was thirsty and she needed water. And Jesus said, you know what? I'll give you something else, living water, okay? You come to church for water because you're thirsty, but stay and receive the living water for which you'll never thirst again, okay? That's the deal. All right, the final thing I want you to see in here is that we're also not, crash test dummies, okay? Look at me at verse nine. It says, and I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God. You know, the folks whose job it is to build cars that are safer, uh, safer vehicles for us to drive will regularly subject these sedans and SUVs and pickup trucks uh, to T-bones and fender benders and head-on collisions to see how they fare. Now, they don't put real people as occupants in these cars, of course, okay? But they use dummies, and you've all seen 
the, the, the slow motion video of a dummy in a crash. Now these poor things, these crash test dummies, they get crunched and they get crumpled and they get smashed and scuffed up, but they're dispensable, right? Who cares about these dummies? They're inanimate objects. What's important is the car and the consumer. Well, oftentimes, for a lot of you, you feel like we take a lot of licks for the benefit of something else. A lot of you feel like crash test dummies, that you, you're a dummy for somebody else's creation, somebody else's dream, somebody else's vision for this church and that ministry or that pro nonprofit, and some charismatic person comes along and puts you in their car. They don't know if it works or how it's going to hold up, but you get behind it and you drive it and you get crashed. Now, these things may or may not get better or succeed for your involvement, but you get destroyed. I know of too many Christians who have been positively destroyed um, in, in church, okay? Well, God's not looking, this is more bad news for you, I guess. God's not looking to spare you from the crash. He's not going to keep you from pain and suffering, because that's certainly coming. Christ promised us in the world trouble. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. But here's the encouraging thing. You're no dummy to him, okay? You're not somebody he's using to test something out. You're not a dispensable tool being used to build a better temple, a better Israel, or a better religious industrial complex. Hear this. You're what he's building. Okay. So, yeah, you're going to get crashed because he wants to make you better. Okay. You're the thing that he's building. You're the temple. You're the empire. You're the religious kingdom. We're the kingdom. And so when he says here that he's going he's to take this third that he's preserved and then throw them into the fire, that sounds like, whoa, oh, I wish I had been just cut off. I don't want to go in the fire. But he said, I'm going to refine you as silver is refined and as gold is refined. I'm going to test you. I'm going to burn all the dross off. I'm going to take out all the slag and everything that's worthless. And I'm going to make you 24 carat vessels for my kingdom. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. And you're going to cry out to me in this process. And I'm going to answer you, and I'm going to say, this is my child, and you're going to say, that's my God, and we're going to go forward. Think of, just really briefly, think of Simon the Zealot. This is one of the men that joined Jesus' band of disciples. Do you remember that? Well, a zealot was a, was a, a, a Jewish sect whose dream it was and vision was to overthrow the Roman Empire. Okay, that's, and these guys swore an oath to give their lives to defeat the emperor in Rome and to kick Rome out of the Holy Land. Now listen, Simon was a crash test dummy for the zealots, okay, because that was not going to happen, all right. This small band of zealots was not going to kick Caesar out of Jerusalem. That was not going to happen. And if Simon had kept on that path, he would have ruined and wrecked his life for something that was never going to happen, okay. But instead, what, did, what happened when he met Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ didn't say, okay, I'll help you overthrow Rome. Jesus Christ came and said, I'm going to overthrow you, Simon. And he came and threw, he, he took Simon on his little throne with the crown on his head, and he toppled him, okay? And because he did that, Simon became a friend of God's and an apostle to an eternal kingdom. Um, Rome was still in place, and it didn't bother Simon anymore. Okay, and Rome continued to persecute God's people and Jerusalem, but you know what? It didn't matter because Simon now was God's child. He'd been refined, and now he didn't, he, you know, you can have Jerusalem. You can have Mount Moriah. You can have the world. You can have the Colosseum. I don't want any of it. I'm a pilgrim now going home, okay? This is my kingdom, and so I challenge you here today, as I began the service here today, Stop giving a handshake to these things that the Lord is sharing. I, I think the Lord shared some in, important things in here today. And I want you to know, I think Emmanuel Church is at a, at a wonderful point. And I think God is prepared to bless us with a challenge, with a charge, with power. But I think it's going to mean the crucible, okay? I think we've begun to see that sifting and that it's been a, it, the, the Lord's doing that. But I'm encouraged. I have a light heart. I'm excited. My head's lifted high because I believe that God has right now for us an opportunity to cry out to him and to hear his voice calling back to us saying we're his children and we're going to say to anybody who wants to hear it that that's our God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for this prophecy that Zechariah gave to your people as they were looking to rebuild the kingdom. And Lord, I think this is a time of rebuilding, but we can't rebuild or, or go back to what we had before. We do need to change. And th there's an important opportunity that we have right now to not change the message and, and to not adapt uh, the, the word of God and the law of God and the ways of God to meet uh, a fragmenting, fallen, sinful, rebellious world, but instead for us to change so that we can be prepared to be the house of bread for the starving around to come and find filling, to find rest, to find truth, to find salvation itself. Lord, it's a wonderful time to be a Christian. It's a wonderful time to be a church family. We're going to need each other, Lord, more than we've ever needed each other before. And the bonds that we're going to have cannot be around bread and circus, but around living water, around a passionate desire to see the world changed, and a, and a wonderful, humble submission to your Son, our Savior and King, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord. In his name we pray. Amen.